All right, so we have a recording. Now I'll minimize this. And hopefully this is shared on Zoom. So um, we've got a great agenda today. I'm going to uh, kick it off with a uh, discussion a little bit on tokenization and interoperability and Web3 um, based on a lot of work that we have done at Oracle uh, in that area, right? We've always been about enterprises and enterprise blockchain, of course, since 2018 when we launched our high of fabric based blockchain platform. But the last couple of years, we've really been pushing the envelope and taking it into Web3 space. It's tokenization and Web3 integration and decentralized identity and you name it, right? We're trying to be uh, as uh, good of a Web3 citizen as we can, uh, given that we are permission blockchains, there is obviously certain you know, limitations, but also certain attraction from an enterprise customer community, I think. So I'll share some of that with you. And then uh, we'll have uh, Peter from Accenture talk about Hyperledger Cactus or Cacti. I, I keep going back and forth, Cacti now, on interoperability and Hart will talk about uh, Hyperledger Firefly. So we've got a really cool agenda. Uh, let me bring up my uh, deck and put it in uh, presentation mode here. Let's see. Okay, I think that's good. Um, I uh, I should point out, by the way, that uh, let me see what is it doing. It's okay. Fine. Uh, let me. See if I minimize this, would it still work? Okay, it should still work. Um, Oracle has been selected for the third year in a row in Forbes Blockchain 50. Um, one of the very few large scale tech companies actually that's been in that Forbes list for three years in a row now. So that's kind of neat. Uh, my role quickly is uh, I'm responsible for product management of our blockchain technology and strategy. Uh, in addition to our blockchain platform, we have a couple other blockchain related solutions and products, which I can tell you about afterwards. So if you want to come by, uh, say hello. But uh, primarily today, we'll talk about the Hyperledger based capabilities that we provide. And uh, uh, what I'm going to try to do is uh, quickly talk about my view of uh, Web3 world and what does it really mean? Because people throw the term around loosely, right? And everybody means whatever it is I've got to sell today, right? You know, whatever's on my track is Web3. Uh, I'm going to try to give it some structure. And then we'll talk about specifically tokenization and decentralized identity and the capabilities that uh, we have developed on top of Hyperledger Fabric, specifically with Oracle Blockchain Platform to do that. And some customer use cases. I will show you some really good examples of uh, how customers are using some of these capabilities, particularly tokenization. Centralized identity is still a little bit experimental and early. There is a few, uh, I would say, opportunities that we're involved in, but not really production. But many others are tokenization use cases in production, and then you know just share a bunch of additional materials. So uh, I like to start with uh, this question that one of my colleagues actually asked a while back, out on Twitter, to describe Web three in one world, right? And you know, people came up with all kinds of interesting answers all over the place, right? What does Web3 really mean? Self-sovereignty, uh, community or identity, transactional, delusional, grift, exit liquidity, and so on. So uh, since you know we are in some sense driving this train forward, right? From a blockchain perspective, I think it behooves us to talk a little bit about our views. My view in particular is that we have two forces or two sets of forces, if you will, that are helping to define Web3. One of them is this general sort of a desire to decentralize things, just intermediate things, and move from a you know sort of cons internet consumer and a browser to a publisher and creator world, right? Where people can create things, they can own things they create, they can monetize them, and perhaps you know avoid some of the intermediate, some of the <laughs> large platforms that have been taking advantage of what content people create and monetizing it for them. But then from the bottom up, there is also a bunch of technologies that have been maturing in the last few years, certainly tokenization or portable digital assets for those who don't like tokenization term, because when I talk tokenization to some of our customers, I think we're talking about credit card number tokenization, right? Very different use of the term. So I've started talking about portable digital assets. The centralized identities that's maturing, particularly with W3C standards, 
uh, decentralized identity, verified credentials, and there is now quite a momentum in that space. We're seeing in the last year actual real world use cases. The centralized storage, that's another big area. Uh, and the centralized governance, right? There is a bunch of things that are happening in that space that I think are still emerging from an enterprise perspective, because enterprise is all about centralized governance. But we're beginning to see in the context of consortia and uh, ecosystems, emergence of desire to adopt some of the decentralized governance capabilities. So you bring that together, and I think what we're going to see is sort of a next generation of a lot of portion to portion, business to business, government to portion, government to business interactions that are powered by these technologies. Certainly there is some amplification from immersive technologies in a virtual reality, metaverses, whatever term you want to apply there. And we're going to see this combination show up essentially as a set of complex services and on-demand capabilities with digital identities, wallets, smart contracts, off-chain, edge computing, and Web3 will be kind of the large envelope into which all of this gets stuck. Right? So when people talk about Web3, it's going to be all of those things, but there is going to be the score driver for decentralization as a North Star guiding principle, and there's going to be the underlying technologies, I think, from the bottom up, trying to uh, actually help make this real. So uh, drilling down on this, right? I try to put together a little bit of a, you know, if you will, uh, uh, table here that shows, you know, what are the relevant technologies in each of these areas. Certainly, from a tokenization perspective, the standards, you know, ERC standards, of course, but also token taxonomy framework, which is now owned by IWA, came out of uh, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, and I think he has some uh, potential future because it provides a more general. Uh, meta framework around which uh, different organization standards can coalesce and we can create not just different standards, but a structure of standards, a family of standards. The centralized data storage, of course, you know, IPFS, everybody knows about IPFS, but there are other solutions. We have an Oracle Cloud, a partner called Zero Chain, which provides similar capabilities that are quite advanced. In the centralized identity, you have uh, DIDs or DIDs uh, and DID documents, verified credentials, and this whole concept of what's called this issue holder and verify a triangle and the capabilities that uh, we probably know best from Hyperledger Indy and Hyperledger Ares wallet technology. And then the centralized governance, right? If you think about the consensus mechanisms, particularly in the permission blockchain, that's a model of governance, but also DAOs and how those DAOs are beginning to be used in a variety of ways. Uh, one of the really interesting things I've heard recently uh, you know, Oracle has been known to sponsor some sports leagues and teams and facilities. Larry Ellison, our chairman in particular, is a great uh, fan of sailing. He was sponsor of America's Cup for a number of years, but recently moved away from that to a new league called SailGP. Uh, SailGP is an international league. They'll be here in San Francisco Bay in May. They run uh, catamarans uh, on foils that go over 50 knots. Over 50 miles an hour on water. It's amazing stuff. I mean, I'm a sailor myself, so it's like, you know. Anyway, so I've been talking to them about some of the things they've been doing with near blockchains. They've been partnering with near for some time. And they're talking about having individual teams convert into a DAO-based organizations where people and sponsors can buy into the DAO as stakeholders. And through the DAO mechanism, actually control the decision-making process of that particular team. And so this is a really interesting example of how, you know, those DAOs beyond just, you know, some financial shenanigans that are going on and all of that, uh, you know, people are thinking about using them. So, uh, you know, what are the benefits? Because, you know, I talk mostly to our customers who are enterprises, government organizations, and they really want to know what's in it for them, right? I mean, you know, is this all stuff out there, you know, in crypto world that they don't want to touch or is there something real there? So I think there is a lot of real capabilities here that uh, can be beneficial uh, in an enterprise space and business space, certainly for tokenization, protecting IP ownership through NFTs, you know, traceable history of lifecycle transactions that you get, and ability to do all sorts of really interesting payments, B2B payments, micropayments, and other kind of things, including most recently we started getting involved in central bank digital currencies around tokenization space. Uh, verified credentials, ZD documents, uh, there is a lot of value actually. Some companies are beginning to think, you know, they spend so much time and uh, resources from a security perspective, managing their identity management, ensure that that does not get breached. 
if all of a sudden a lot of that moves out to individual user wallets, there's nothing to bridge. It saves them so much from a risk perspective and cost perspective that they're beginning to think the centralized identity actually has something to offer to enterprises. And then, you know, uh, centralized governance, that's a harder sell to companies. But I think uh, if you work in a consortium setting where companies are working together and you have, you know, leagues, sports leagues and other things like that, I think there may be something there as well. So that just, you know, my thoughts on why that matters. Now, drilling down on tokenization a little bit, right? I mean, obviously, we've been seeing adoption of this in enterprise use cases, uh, you know, ownership transfer or not ownership, but just usage rights, right? You might have specific license rights that you want to be able to offer. Uh, ability to verify ownership history, allow fractional ownership to help increase liquidity. You can track digital assets of, of you know, uh, actual, you know, online only tokens, but also digital twins of uh, physical assets, which is quite important in a number of companies that deal with high value assets uh, for B2B transactions, but also in B2C engagements. And uh, you can use a token mechanism and smart contracts to control the operations that your enterprise systems form on those assets, which is quite important, right? So you have agreed rules, you know, who's trying to make a particular state transition or state change, and you can determine if that's, you know, going to be allowed or not and so on. So uh, there is a lot of uh, potential interest there in creating a bit more of a uh, standardized mechanism for enterprise systems to manage that, right? Of course, you know, we know the history, probably everybody's familiar with the history of tokenization from Bitcoin to NFTs, but what we're beginning to see is emerging interest from enterprises for using fungible tokens and rewards and loyalty programs, royalty tracking, cross-border funds transfers, CBDC, and other digital currency applications, and NFTs as well in uh, reward systems, component traceability in regulated uh, supply chains, regulated production environments. Uh, we have some companies that are doing electric vehicle battery passports. Uh, German government has created a coalition of local vendors that one of our partners on the Oracle blockchain is actually implementing a battery passport for a lot of German automakers. And another one recently implemented the same thing on Oracle blockchain for Ford, where Ford electric vehicle batteries are actually in, you know, tracking the batteries with a passport identifier that has unique capabilities to identify not just a battery, but certain components. And as it's going through repair, reuse, because batteries at some point not good enough to drive the car, but they're good enough for other things that can be reused, repurposed, and then ultimately recycled, and so on. Electronic bill of lading, uh, one of our uh, consortia companies that we've been working with, Global Shipping Business Network, JSBN, which is in this maritime shipping world, they have container shipping companies, sports, terminal operators, so, you know, logistics and shipping, started putting on electric bi electronic bill of lading capabilities on top of the blockchain to be able to provide essentially this negotiable document and transfer it electronically without anybody having to print it, query it, and so on, which is a really big thing. And there is a lot of standardization effort happening around that as well. So just a bunch of examples. Yeah, I think there was a question there. Yeah. Um, just uh, to my context, I've been working on rewards, loyalty, airline programs for 25 years. And one of my uh, new companies um, is attempting to do loyalty and rewards using the blockchain and different tokens and all of that. Sure. And the number one problem we run across in the enterprise and we're still fighting is a mistrust of the regular blockchain and crypto and conflating it with the, you know all the stuff that's going on. Yeah. Is that is that kind of you guys having I mean, the private and your work Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we don't see that as much in the last couple of years as it's been in the prevalent in the past. So we often uh, have to explain the difference. Uh, and we often, well, sometimes cautioned or advised by, you know, the people within an enterprise that want to promote this, to use the term distributed ledger rather than blockchain. That seems to go easier sometimes. But definitely we have to do some education because uh, for some people, you know, they read every day about cryptos, they read about, you know, FTX and everybody, who is you know, taking advantage of people there and uh, they have questions, right? I mean, how is this related, how secure it is and so on. So there is always some education that we have to do um, you know, as we go into some of those opportunities with customers. Absolutely. And, and I'll share maybe a few examples, but just a little bit to drill down on tokenization, right? So our platform, uh, we started in 2017 and we released it in 2018 is uh, Oracle blockchain platform based on Hyperledger Fabric. We felt that this was the strongest and best 
permissioned enterprise blockchain technology out there. And five years later, we still believe that's the case. But you've done a lot of work, of course, to extend it as well for enterprise customer needs. Now, it does not have native token support. Um, but nevertheless, we had you know, a number of situations where customers, partners built application chain codes, smart contracts, to emulate ERC20, ERC721, and the like, uh, in order to provide organization support. And we said, look, why you know, have everybody build it every single time from scratch? They can provide out of the box libraries that implement that. And we have this cool, cool low code development tool we, call, we build called Blockchain App Builder, uh, which generates code automatically from templates and specifications. And so we said we create specifications for ERC20 or TTF based uh, tokens, ERC721, and the like. And that's what we've done. It's basically started with token taxonomy framework structure. We created a meta model, we created the templates, and then we automatically generate all of the lifecycle methods from that uh, template based on the behaviors that you specify, burnable, mintable, transferable, all of those things, so that you could deploy it automatically and you know you can build on top of that if you want. And we also here to do some optimization inside Hyperledge Fabric peers to avoid MVCC conflicts, uh, which we've done, so we can now do multiple token transactions per block at high speed uh, and so on. And we've added support for NFT, of course, ERC721 and ERC1155 uh, over time as well. Uh, so we have you know, a lot of different tokenization engines now available. Uh, just a little bit on you know, a platform to give you a sense of how that was built, right? So in a standard hyperledger fabric, you have peer nodes that have copies of the ledger. You have you know, them running smart contracts as well. Then ordering service nodes, which are responsible for creating blocks from transactions. Uh, through the rough consensus mechanism and then sending them back to the peers to be verified and appended to the ledger. There is membership service, which basically is a fabric CA that uh, creates uh, X509 certificates for identity management of all the components and all of the organizations and so on. We've added a bunch of things from an Oracle perspective, such as operation storing, API gateway for REST API integration and event uh, callbacks. We've built an app builder, which is a low code developer tool to build smart contracts. Um, you know, we interoperate with other hyperledger public nodes, so we have uh, customers running across multiple clouds and uh, multiple uh, providers, as well as on-premises version, as well as it's available outside of Oracle Cloud, integrated into Oracle database, so they can feed the ledger data in uh, asynchronously, so you could do analytics, machine learning, and other things. And on the left-hand side, you know, provide a lot of integration capabilities through the same REST API, as well as integration adapters, to make it easy to integrate applications, back office systems of records that everybody kind of depends on. So this whole pre-assembled managed service, you know, there is one screen, three or four fields you need to fill out to provision it. 10, 15 minutes later, everything is there and ready to go. And so, you know, very easy to use. Uh, we've done a lot of work to add to the core uh, community edition of Hyperledger Fabric around, you know, cloud provisioning and management, zero downtime patching, operations tooling, uh, we've extended a lot of security and auditability features as well. Find your master's control, on-chain audit log, integrity validation, you know, block integrity validation, identity management integration, and some of the things I talked about already in terms of the local tooling, code generation, but most recently atomic updates as well. This is something that many of our customers really needed to be able to integrate blockchain with other resources or complex applications where you have transactions spanning multiple channels multiple chain codes on the blockchain in Fabric natively today, you cannot commit them with the same atomic transactions that actually overcomes that issue with two-phase commit and recently added Ethereum interoperability as well. So you can now do atomic transaction across Fabric and Ethereum in the same basically invocation and some data management and other things. So, um, but as part of that, uh, you know, oh, uh, this is just where to find it if you have some interest uh, in playing with it, you can go into Oracle Cloud, cloud.oracle.com, set up an account. There is a, a menu here, we call it hamburger menu, uh, just those three lines. And that gives you access to drop down into all of the different services. On the developer services, you'll find blockchain platform, a simple menu to provision it, select the different shapes and the version and a couple other things. And then it goes off and creates it. And all of the infrastructure resources, all of the nodes for Fabric itself, all the add-on components you mentioned are there in 10, 15 minutes that you can go ahead and, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll come to that. I have a couple of slides on that and 
I can I can share with that. Yeah, uh, this was a on-premise version that runs in VMware or VirtualBox. It's basically a virtual machine, but the same package, the same software, pretty much all the same capability, just for customers who, for various reasons, want to run outside the Oracle Cloud or in the third-party cloud environment. But you can also build hybrid networks. Some of our customers want to run on-premise and in the cloud at the same time, or the ecosystems rather. There is a management operations console that makes it very easy to do the configuration, management, administration, adding, extending different nodes, uh, creating channels, deploying chain codes, all of that. Uh, Lifecycle management of smart contracts as well, either through the blockchain app builder, which is a downloadable tool, or uh, directly through this web console. And then, you know, monitoring troubleshooting. Uh, here you can see the relationships of peer nodes to different channels. Um, there is a lot of uh, dashboards and uh, ledger browser to be able to drill down on a particular channel to blocks, use the blocks and then transactions inside the blocks and all of that. Kind of an admin view, of course, for applications, you would build something very specific. So, uh, you know, this has been uh, the work we've done to make it easy for enterprises to adopt. That's why many enterprises have chosen Oracle platform. But beyond the infrastructure, there is also requirements around the applications themselves, right? The platform itself is quite a central platform. So we have two things. One is a portfolio of partners with industry solutions across many verticals, and also the slow code dev tool called Blockchain App Builder. And this is really a neat tool because it can automatically generate smart contracts from templates. Uh, you can take existing templates and tailor them, or you can create new ones. They're written in YAML or JSON, very easy to use. And uh, we now extended that with templates for tokenization. So you can create fungible token, non-fungible token chain codes as well in that environment. Uh, it's uh, a tool that you can download from the platform. It runs in Visual Studio Code as an extension. So you can bring it up in a GUI environment. There's also a command line version for CI CD. And it manages the entire process from editing the templates to scaffolding and creating the chain code. We generate in TypeScript and Go. And then testing. There is a built in version of Fabric for local testing, deployment, and then also deployment to the blockchain platform in the cloud. Uh, for actual, you know, um, nodes uh, in uh, test or production environment as well. Um, kind of a sim simple flow here. You start with a specification file. That's like I said, a YAML or JSON file. And once you tailor it, you can generate the scaffold and the chain code. And this will generate basically the CRUD methods. Or if it's a token template, it will generate all of the lifecycle operations necessary, all the chain code methods for the lifecycle of the token. You can extend it as custom methods if you want to, or you could use it as is and deploy it directly. Um, you can deploy and test it locally. Uh, there is a drop-down menu to execute all of the methods that we generate. Um, and then you have ability to package and deploy directly to Oracle Cloud environment. Um, so a very easy to use tool. And if you're not a blockchain developer uh, and you've never written chain code, this is a good place to start because it will generate basic stuff for you. And you can run it directly through the REST APIs. And then you can play around and extend it if you want to and modify it, because it's all in source code. Uh, so we use this for tokenization support. And this is how we started introducing tokenization to our enterprise customers. Initially, with fungible tokens based on TTF model, and later on with NFTs as well. Uh, we have added support in the recent release to do uh, liquidity pool exchanges for cross-currency or you have fungible tokens, for example, in a multi-brand loyalty program, and they have different weights and you need to do exchanges. So there's this methodology called exchange pools or liquidity pools that has somebody who has accounts with multiple token IDs and exchange rates that can be set by APIs. So this is something that we've added recently. But the basic mechanism is essentially you start with a template here. You see, this is a fungible token example. You define the anatomy, the behaviors, and some parameters, some custom properties you can add, and then we'll generate account based setup environment, role based security as well. Uh, and then the lifecycle methods necessary to create, you know, mint, uh, transfer, um, and burn, and so on, all the tokens. So this is pretty straightforward environment. Um, this tokenization engine uh, has basically uh, three layers there is an SDK layer for each of the different token types, there is a set of wrapper functions that can unify it and provide all the management, setup, querying, and so on. Uh, there can be customized functions and then role based security added in there as well. So you can specify the roles for who can mint, who can burn, and so on. You can take all of this and run it directly, exposed through the REST APIs, or you can extend it with your own custom code 
and uh, you can essentially invoke those functions if you need more complex business logic. Or you can leave that chain code alone and create another chain code for your business functions that use cross-chain code invocation to call the token chain code as well. And uh, this is what some of our customers have been doing. Um, last release, we've added ERC-1155. This is a new standard for those of you who are not familiar that combines fungible and non-fungible tokens. So you could have a single chain code now that allows you to manage uh, both fungible and non-fungible and NFTs. You could do batch uh, operations. So you could do batch minting, uh, batch transfers, and so on. Um, and you can exchange fungible tokens for non-fungibles and vice versa. So some of the key capabilities there. So we generate all of those methods from a description. Um, this is an example. We have a demo actually uh, of using this where you can buy NFT actually integrated with Ethereum. So you could buy it with an ERC20 coin. And you know this uh, is a mechanism that uh, we're seeing many of customers going forward will start using because in many NFT applications, there is also a need for fungible tokens as well and dynamic NFTs as well. So um, this is just a illustration of liquidity pools where you have ability, let's say you're doing multi-currency CBDC, central bank digital currency. So you need to be able to do exchange between multiple currencies. So you have somebody which owns exchange pool accounts, you have multiple tokens, new balances. There is a transaction request to set it up, initialize at conversion rates, et cetera. Um, you can then fund the balances in here either as percentage of the minting function, you put, can put in a percentage of what you minted, or just regular transfer method from other liquidity providers. And then you just call token conversion method. And this is atomically going to exchange one currency for another using the swap based on preset rates, and then pay out to the other account in that other currency. Uh, comes in really handy. Wait, so who's absorbing the currency? So this is basically set by APIs. So in an enterprise setting, you set whatever rates you want to set. And if you want to introduce, you know, some delta factors there, that's up to you. The enterprise currently is accepting these Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can change. Yeah, it's an API base, so you can change it any minute you want. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I mentioned earlier that we did also that was important is this concept of atomic transactions, right? So how many are familiar with some of the marbles samples, couple of fabric samples, right? Marbles, everybody, anybody played with that? Everybody? Okay. It basically shows an example where you have an object that has some properties that color, size, et cetera, and owners, and you can transfer them. So there is another uh, sample, a uh, sample called example zero two, where you have a uh, transfer of uh, some numeric value, right, from account A to account B. So let's say you actually want to deploy an application where somebody buys marbles and pays for them using the example tokens, but you have marbles running on one channel, you have a payment running on a different channel for scalability, right? When you separate them out in Fabric, and you want to make sure that the payment and the transfer of ownership is done atomically, right? It both happen or you know, nothing happens. So we created this atomic transaction API that you can walk through our REST content gateway. And you basically specify an array of transactions with a chain code name, parameters, and a channel name. And using two-phase commit mechanism, where we actually first do a prepare, where transactions are stored as pending in the ledger with a pending flag. And then if everybody agrees that you know, prepare has completed, then we do a commit. And uh, we then can commit it to the actual state, world state. So then, or we can do rollback if you know, somebody fails. So this was kind of the capabilities that started us on the path of atomic transaction support, where we said initially, we had customers who needed to do this complex stuff across multiple channels. All right, so that was great. Uh, we then said, why don't we extend that uh, by uh, including other blockchains in that, right? So, you know, of course, everybody wants to play with Ethereum. So we, in our gateway here, added support, we had to fix them, we added yes client, right? This is a go implementation of Ethereum client that allows us to talk to any EVM or Ethereum-based network. And then we've orchestrated essentially what we call a two-phase commit with uh, last, um, last resource commit optimization. Uh, the way this works, because on the Ethereum side, you don't have two-phase commit. Uh, it's not you know, an XA resource. So essentially we do a transaction, atomic transaction, we will do a prepare phase on our blockchain course. Uh, we will then go and use Ethereum client to make a call to do a transaction in smart contract. 
And in there, we specify certain finality criteria, so how many blocks to wait, how long to wait time, et cetera. And verify, and if that happens, then we come back here and we do a commit. And if this fails, then we'll do a rollback. This allows us to do, without any bridging, essentially uh, atomic operations across multiple chains. And uh, I think someone was asking, you know, what are some of the use cases? I'll show you in a second, but this is what it looks like uh, from an API perspective, where you have this request and transaction, so you're specifying on top of the invite, this is our calculated fabric uh, transaction uh, with FT, NIT, Q3, whatever that chain code is. And then here, the seller sees the theory request. And you can specify a sign to answer the request. You can specify the finality parameters. I check finality, true or false, blocks to wait, all of that. And uh, we'll then go ahead and do prepare, execute this, do the verification. And then if everything is good, we'll go ahead and commit on the Oracle side and you get a response back that shows you the transaction ID for prepare, transaction for commit, and then the transaction ID as well on the Ethereum side. And if you were to go and look up the Ether scan, the transaction, you will actually find the transaction ID here as well, because it happened in our case with testnet using Gori for that example here. But uh, this is essentially the mechanism that allows us to do atomic transactions. And those atomic transactions support things like atomic asset, atomic asset exchanges. So, uh, you know, you might have uh, a custodial wallet and our tokenization system, and you need to fund it, and you can pre-fund it with Ethereum transfer, Ethereum payment. Right, or some other payment, um, ERC20. Um, you might have an NFT on Oracle blockchain, and to buy it, you're paying with you know, Ethereum, Ethcoin, or ERC20. Uh, you know, or you want to mint an NFT on Oracle blockchain uh, for confidentiality, et cetera. But then if somebody buys it, you want to enable them to transfer it to a public chain like Polygon, which is an EVM chain for liquidity on the secondary market. And so this allows you to do all of those things. Right? And there's a bunch of other examples. Uh, sometimes uh, customers want to have a public proof of something private that happened on Hyperledger Fabric Network, which involves confidential data. But then the actual proof, the hex of that transaction can be published because it's one of the hex that doesn't disclose any data on public uh, Ethereum network, for example. So uh, a couple things. One is there's nothing to hack. Bridges are hacked frequently. There is a time window where that asset does not exist on either blockchain if you're using a bridge. Right? So whoever's operating a bridge, it's more or less centralized. Right? It's under control of that entity. And whether it's milliseconds or seconds or hours, I don't know, but you know we hear about bridges being hacked all the time. This way, it always exists either on one blockchain or another blockchain. There is no in between. Yeah. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Oh, okay, yeah. Know. Okay, sure, yeah, absolutely. So let me wrap up here. Uh, the other thing that we've done is, you know, we do have people that come to us from a Ethereum Solidity background and want to reuse those contracts. So we actually provide the support to be able to run uh, EVM chain code on Hyperledger Fabric node with Solidity chain codes. And uh, this is an example of a remix idea where you can talk to Oracle blockchain and deploy Solidity chain code. Uh, but the next step was, and this is what important because people want to connect wallets. So we use the Fab3 provider to actually publish the Web3 APIs, right, JSON RPC APIs, and then be able to talk to, you know, Hyperledger Fabric fee running EVM. And this is now uh, something that uh, we have partners, customers taking advantage of, uh, in fact, one of the companies will show an example, LifePlex sitting behind there uh, using this. Um, so uh, just a couple of quick words on decentralized identity, because we're beginning to see that as well. That's an important part of Web3. Uh, people are beginning to think about it from a variety of interesting use cases. I had a call with some folks in Japan because they're thinking about driver licenses, potentially uh, having DIDs associated with them. Uh, some folks in uh, US and one of the state governments where there is a lot of activity, things being issued left and right by counties, and they want to create a uh, basically statewide, count, across all counties and state agencies, backbone DAD registry, so that everybody goes to the same registry for DADs. Um, so we see a bunch of that. There is a lot of value 
to actually provide identity back in the hands of the users, right? With wallets and so on and interoperability, transparency. And for organizations that manage identity, it's really something that can save a lot of headaches compared to how they manage identity today. So there's a whole bunch of use cases that W3C popularized. You know, if you're into the space, you're probably familiar with them. But what we've done is we've actually implemented a mechanism that uh, allows us to implement GAD registry on our blockchain on Fabric. And there's a front end server that provides a standard verifier and issue of functions and folder. And then a uh, variety of integrations here for the wallet, right? So there's custodial wallet integrations, as well as hyperledger areas that can be used to integrate with that environment as well. And this decentralized identity thing is getting to be more and more popular from conversation that we're seeing. So just very quickly, a few examples here of actual enterprise customers. Um, you see a bunch of categories here. We've worked in financial services, retail, supply chain, manufacturing, logistics, Web3, and kind of overlaid where tokens come in in some of these use cases, right? Some fungible, some non-fungible, but we're beginning to see you know, that uh, many applications that would have been implemented last couple of years, you know, a couple of years ago in a more custom manner and are gravitating towards using tokens as a standardized kind of framework for implementing, right? And so here's some examples of partners that implement ticketing application using our fungible tokens. Um, we implemented a CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency Sandbox. It's actually running right now in a POC in one of the larger countries in Asia. And this is using our blockchain, uh, our tokenization engine, and then an application built on top for interbank uh, transfers, issuing and so on. So there's different roles for central bank and for the uh, various financial institutions that are part of this environment. And uh, there's quite a bit of interest to think it might go into a more of a live pilot uh, later this year. Um, we have uh, a partner here, LifePlex. Uh, they're sitting in the back of the room, guys wave. Uh, if you want to talk to them a little bit more, they provide NFT marketplace solution. And this is essentially creating a Web3 framework with NFT infrastructure, uh, onboarding, you know, wallet management, wallet custodial, wallet generation, and all of that governance on top of Oracle blockchain platform, but also supporting other chains. So you could do you know, cross-chain operations through that mechanism as well. Uh, and they do a lot of work with uh, you know, uh, immersive capabilities as well to actually integrate the NFT into all kinds of you know, onboarding and education environments and fan engagement and so on. Uh, another one, also NFT marketplace in Europe being worked on around NFTs as investments. So this is basically taking KPI data feeds that's coming from blockchain nodes or various partner companies, creating through the NFT generator factory, the actual NFTs dynamically that have the relevant KPI data and turning them into alternate investments, which is kind of interesting. Uh, this was a product-based NFT. So this is a company that does textiles, but they don't do any work. They actually have materials, and then everybody else does outsource manufacturing, intermediate products, fiber, yarn, fabric, and then ultimately garments and so on. So it's 7.5. Uh, they maintain constant body temperature and stuff. You might have seen them in stores. And uh, they wanted to track. They used to do all of the tracking of inventory, intermediate products, and royalties that they collect using spreadsheets. And we basically put them on a blockchain to provide real-time visibility instead of end of the month spreadsheet for this. Uh, government grants programs. This is something interesting. Uh, National Science Foundation issues a lot of grants. And then those grants turn into sub-grants and sub-grants. And they lose track. They cannot follow more than one tier. Uh, and then people have a hell of a time spending a lot of energy and resources and actually spending a lot of research time responding to all kinds of data requests to provide reports on where they spend the money. So we provided a demo for them. It's currently in an RFI stage of multi-tier grant management using fungible tokens with NFTs for the grant letter awards, but then the disbursements are done through fungible tokens. And then a bunch of other things. We've announced Volvo Group recently, uh, transportation management, basically freight transportation management. Um, the one in the middle is in India, which is around uh, uh, basically a trade documents, so export, import, um, you know, related documents. And then on the right is the one I mentioned in Europe, uh, which is this alternate investments, uh, NFT marketplace. All right, uh, I'll skip that. This is just uh, Juniper. So just some concluding thoughts here. I'll wrap up because I want to give uh, Peter and Hart time as well to talk about their projects. But uh, I think uh, we're going to see a lot more Web3 technologies permeating into enterprises. 
Uh, there is value there if you can package it properly, if you can position it, and if you can and provide it in an enterprise grade framework, right? You know, they're not going to go and do things on public chains uh, because there is always a lot of concern about security, confidentiality, scale, performance, all of those things throughput. But in a permission blockchain, it has the same capabilities, if more comfortable. So beginning to see, you know, technologies such as tokenization, decentralized identity, and so on, actually getting some hearing and getting some adherence as long as they're being done in a kind of enterprise framework. So I think there is a lot of potential there. Um, I think we need to continue to provide in an enterprise grade environment those capabilities as they continue to emerge, understand what's happening in public chains, but also then adopt it into the uh, permission chains. All right. Um, we'll, uh, you know, we're looking at a couple other hyperledger of projects actually. So we'll talk about Fact and Firefly. I just wanted to mention this Opsys C Operation Smart Contract Hyperledger Lab, which is a governance project, and I think this is going to be really interesting. Uh, we're thinking about ex <laughs> extending that beyond the uh, chain code management. So today, when you deploy chain code, you have to go through approval and commit process, and that's what the current implementation focuses on. We think it can go beyond and become a governance engine around who can join the chain, who can create channels, who can join the channel uh, with uh, voting and all of those things. So that's going to be really interesting as we get to it in our roadmap. Uh, looking at integration of uh, Hyperledge Cacti, Hyperledge Firefly as well, some of the Web3 stuff. And that's it. So there's a bunch of info there. Uh, you know, We have uh, a lot of blogs published. Uh, there is a solution playbook for NFT marketplace. You can scan that code. Uh, We'll make the deck available as well and we have the recording. Uh, we have an ebook also that talks a lot about enterprise use cases. So if you're interested to go into the big depths of where this is being used in different industries, uh, take a look at that uh, a bitly link oracle underscore blockchain underscore ebook. And then just, you know, if you want to play with it, you can go get some free credits. So there is, I think, uh, an option to do $300, 30 days free credit on Oracle Cloud. So. Uh, you can easily provision and you can be within 30 minutes playing with this organization support. All right, I'll stop here and uh, ask uh, Peter to come up and while he's setting up, I can take a few questions. You mentioned the uh, near protocol. Yeah. So, you know, they are very focused on value contracts. Like contract right. And so, you mentioned the liquidity. There was some work, uh, there was a project that, frankly, I have not heard much about lately. I think it's called uh, Transact. Uh, but I think we need to check what happened. It's been, it's been at least six months since I've seen any updates. From the hyperledger community. Yeah, from a hyperledger community. So I'm not sure if it's still going strong or not. Yeah. Right. No, I think the whole industry on the non uh, on the public chain side is, is moving towards that one. Is that the GMI? Okay. Yeah. And maybe if you're okay, Peter, I may just present the mirror. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of my uh, so we had one, but I think we tried and it did not, it did not work, right? Peter, Wi-Fi password still did not work for you. Yeah, and I was supposed to be sending like individual emails to everybody who sends up, but since I did not have emails for everybody, uh, we didn't get it. So I tried to get a couple, but for some reasons it did not work. Oh, um, so Zoom, I, uh, let me see how can I do that. You can't connect to my Zoom because you're not on the Wi-Fi. So you want, can you can you do your own, start a Zoom session and just record your session? I can, yeah. Can you do that? And then we'll just uh, stitch the files. Okay. You want to join the same Zoom link as you used and then... Yeah, but that the problem is uh, <laughs> you can't join on the network. It's so gonna get the Wi-Fi to work. Part, do you want to say something about Transact? Uh, yeah, Transact is probably going to be uh, end of life soon. Um, just a lot of people haven't been used to it. 
that being said, Wasm is permeating a number of different projects.